Hi, I'm John Grease III, editor and publisher of the Home Gym Quarterly, the only magazine in the world that's written by and for home gym owners. Today my guests are Holly Myers and Aaron Grogan, who help people from around the world get stronger, move better, and achieve their personal fitness goals. We talked about how their unique backgrounds from martial arts to Holly's art major influence how they approach strength training as well as coaching and why it's so important to know the answer to the question, cookies or cake? Check it out. Holly, Aaron, good talking to you guys. I have been looking forward to interviewing you for some time now. Um, so I'm really glad that you carved out some time for me. Welcome to the Garage and Life Media YouTube channel. Thank you so much. Thanks for having us. Oh, yeah. Like I said, I've, I've been looking forward to interviewing you because when I was researching you, I found so many points of commonality where our lives seem to have like intersected just at different times in history, I guess. Like, our, Aaron, you're a JKD black belt, a Jeet Kune Do black belt, yep. through Dan Inosanto, and I trained under Chet Blaylock, who came through Richard Bastillo. Um, and he was, well, Joe Lewis and Richard Bastillo, I don't even want to get into all that, <laughs> <laughs> among other teachers. But, and then Holly, you're from Northern California, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, and I went to Shasta College in Reading uh, for two years from 1990 to 1992. So I lived there, and of course, I was at Pendleton when I was in the Marine Corps. So it's like, I feel like I've been either following your footsteps, following you guys around, or you've been following me. There's some sort of stalking going on here, but yeah. Um, more relevant to the interview, though, we both seem to have recently encountered David Weck and the Weck Method. Um, I found out about it uh, because we had one of our writers for our magazine did an article on him. And uh, so I started getting interested in the dragon roll and all in the Royal call and whatnot. How did you guys discover it? Um, I think that I came across one of his coaches, um, Chris Chamberlain on Instagram. Yeah. And uh, I was like, wow, this dude, he does some really interesting things and just like really cool things. Go ahead. And then I saw some of his, uh, some of his posts and content on uh, rope training. And I was like, huh, this is really interesting. We should look into it more. Okay. And, uh, earlier. Yeah, that rope year, stuff is crazy. When you see him oh, doing yeah. the dragon roll, you're just like, like, because when he explains it on YouTube, you watch the YouTube, he's like, okay, I'm doing this and I'm doing this. But when he's doing it fast, like, that's not what you're doing. That does I not look at all. Like, yeah, it's simple. No, it's not. It's just you moving. You got to slow it down. <laughs> yeah. All right. So you, anyway, but so you guys saw, uh, you said Chris Chamberlain? Yeah. Yeah, we took a lesson with him in okay. San Diego in January. Yeah, January. Yeah. Uh, and learn just kind of the basics of the ropes and what else did we do? The, sh well, I don't know. The pulsers. Oh yeah, the pulsers. A little bit of the RMT club. Mm -hmm. um, but mostly what we've, we've been practicing since we learned from him uh, is RMT ropes. Okay. Yeah. Um, so I mentioned your Jeet Kune Do background. Uh, Aaron, what are some of your other influences? Um, so I've, I've trained in um, Jeet Kune Do, as, as we mentioned already. Primarily, but I've also um, trained pretty extensively in Filipino martial arts at Kali. And I think that a lot of my appreciation for uh, why I'm into the RMT ropes and also recently Indian clubs is mm. because of my nearly 10 years in uh, Kali training. And right. just, so much of it just feels so similar and just it yeah. feels good to do. So it's cool to have the martial, uh, martial arts application background and then to train other styles that aren't necessarily martial arts it's just cool how it blends like that okay and then holly you are i, I think i mentioned it before to you before you're the world's strongest art major but you're also <laughs> strong first elite um for people who don't know what how big a deal that is give me some insight into um what that is, the, the kind of weights you're handling, especially the Iron Maiden one. I'm really impressed by that. Uh, yeah, so we're both Strong First Elite, which means we oh, okay, have cool. four different certifications from Strong First, um, two different kettlebell ones, and then a bodyweight one and a barbell one. Okay. Uh, and those, uh, you use weights relative to your body weight, so it's kind of it kind of levels the playing field a little bit in that way, but uh, the Iron Maiden is is not a certification. It's just a challenge that okay. I think only about, I think less than 50 women have in the world or have completed. Okay. Uh, and that's a pull up, 
a strict overhand pull up with 24 kilos hanging around your waist, uh, and then a strict military press with it, and then also a pistol squat. Um, so I asked about influences because you guys are like, um, one of the, the things when I was looking and researching you, Aaron, is you have Dr. Stuart McGill on one hand, and he's all about, don't even do crunches, okay? Nothing that rotates your spine. And then, and, and I think from what I know uh, of Strong First, uh, there's also some notion of maintaining a certain rigidity um, and with bracing. And then on the other side of things, you have David Weck, who is, hey, you need to be fluid, you need to flow or whatever. And I, and I think some of that is influenced because he's a track coach. So you can't run stiff. I mean, you won't run fast or far if you're stiff. Uh, but at the same time, it, it seems like for both of you, um, there's going to be some sort of conflict when you go to, you know, like you go to the certification and this guy's telling you something that violates, you know, not even just kind of, kind of disagrees with, but in some cases violates things that you've heard before. Does the JKD help you with that? Because, you know, like we were taught, hey, it's research your own experience, take from different places, and then absorb what's useful to you, whatever you can make work, and then whatever you can't, just discard it because it's useless. It's not useless, period. It's just useless to you. So does that help you when you're at the seminar or the workshop or the whatever to kind of turn off that other voice that's like, ah, but excuse me, teacher said, you know, whatever. Yeah, I, um, I definitely, I like to take things, try them on, on for myself um, in, in my coach's shoes with my students as well. But to see how these different principles actually apply. Um, and it's with my martial arts training, especially Jeet Kune Do, I, uh, well, let me back up a sec. So years ago when I was training very heavily in Jeet Kune Do, my training partner and I, um, we had a little saying, which I'm sure other trainees in Jeet Kune Do did as well, but we would say, uh, it's not my JKD. Yeah. So we would yeah. try a technique. Always we want to be open to absorb it just to see how we like it and if it works well for us. We would try something. If it wasn't like our favorite thing or just maybe it didn't work very well with our body or our speed um we would be like no that's not my jkd but maybe that's yours right? right so the very similar approach is how i take take to strength training or just learning other movements in general like i don't think that it's always black or white for everybody if something maybe does work for me it might not for you and i, I think that's okay yeah so same question for you holly but from the standpoint of the fact that you were an art major because you are familiar with uh, different influences. You can look at a painting from one period versus another period. You can look at different kinds of art and see how they kind of stack on each other. Like mm -hmm. you, I wouldn't have this if this hadn't happened before or whatever, right? So right. does that help you when you go to approach the thing? Because like if my wife and I both take a class, um, because she's more into like endurance stuff and I think running is evil. Um, <laughs> I just, I just don't like doing it. Um, then, and I tell her something, she's going to have like the, okay, but, and then if she tells me something, I'm going to have the, okay, but so then he comes and he tells you everything he just said, oh, I think it'll work as it, and how do you turn the voice off? Is it because you're, like I said, the influence is from art? I think the, the first thing that pops to my head is, is aiming to make my movement look beautiful hmm. or like look yeah. uh, not artistic, but like bring a sort of um, artistic quality to it. Okay. Oh yeah. Um, yeah. 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 And then in terms of for us, when we're making uh, videos and stuff, always like being mindful of what is, what angle is this from and where, and you know, that kind of thing. Uh, but keeping an open mind and also, looking at the balance and the harmony between the whole of our movement practice. Like if everything's so rigid and just everything's sagittal plane, all that stuff, where's the balance of the other stuff too. Right. So I think that also having that, that creative mind, 
that can kind of help me see those other things. When you said beautiful movement, uh, maybe it's because the documentary just came out and I haven't even seen it. But the first thing I thought of was Michael Jordan in the air. Mm-hmm. And it's so strange. A guy with his tongue hanging out <laughs> all right, shouldn't be beautiful in the air, right? But there was something just graceful about him. And it's because kinesthetically, he just, his bot, he just had so much kinesthetic awareness of his body and how he moved through space. So it makes sense. It makes sense to me. And then at the same time, there are people I watch deadlift. So if I watch my friend, uh, if I watch Pete Rubish deadlift, right? It looks impressive and inspiring, but it's not necessarily beautiful. But if I watch somebody like, say, uh, uh, Kayla Woolham deadlift just because of the way he does it and some of the Russian lifters when I watch them deadlift it looks like artistic almost as like sometimes they don't even look like they're straining it's just yeah. like the bodies are just moving through space mm-hmm. and so I, I get that and 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 how you you put that together is pretty cool um let's talk about something else uh as barefoot training Holly is a fan of barefoot training. Anybody who sees your Instagram just sees you very rarely with shoes on. Um, and for the record, I prefer being barefoot myself. But then whenever I go somewhere and I'm around other powerlifters, they're always like, why don't you have shoes on? And I have to go through that. So let's talk about just how does being barefoot improve you as a lifter? I just, I just feel like I'm way, I can connect to the ground so much better. I have so much more feedback. Um, I... I mean, shoes never feel as good as barefoot to me. I mean, I can see how I would improve it with doing kettlebell stuff. But in addition to all the stuff you guys do, you know, with the uh, kettlebells and whatnot, you also competed in a powerlifting meet. And what's funny is that powerlifting meet, I didn't know that I was expected to be wearing shoes. (laughs) (laughs) Everybody else has got on all the stuff. And you showed up, be like, hey, 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 who let this hippie in here? (laughs) <laughs> and I had like my Vivo barefoot shoes to okay. <laughs> wear because it was the the thing that kind of felt the most like what I how, like how I train, which is barefoot. Right. Yeah. And so, yeah, I I'm also like not a super fan of a bunch of equipment. Why not just be able to do it? Yeah. How you know if I was just gonna walk up to a weight and just lift yeah. it? Like, why need all that equipment? But I'm not saying I'm also not an elite powerlifter, so like. Yeah. Well, there are there are reasons why people use that, but it's it's not really my focus. I, I was telling my son who trains with me, um, it's kind of like um, he actually competes in powerlifting. I I used to, and he does still now. Whenever, honestly, he'll say I want to compete, and I will just find a meet and put it, and you know, he'll do it. But I was talking about equipment, and I said, all right, so it's kind of like playing football. You can run and catch a football. Uh, without any of that equipment on. But if you plan to do it on the field, you probably need to practice with the equipment on because you're going to be expected to wear it and it's going to be, it's going to enhance your ability as a football player on the field. It doesn't mean that when you take all that stuff off that you suddenly lose the ability to run and catch a football. It's just, you know, situation dependent. Um, We had a recent interaction where you guys, um, you asked, you know, like how bent pressing has uh, helped the different people who do it, right? And I said that it is actually helping me with my squats because it is. Well, I feel like it is, so that's good enough for me. Um, it's, I feel like it's helping me with my squats in the sense that as my body weight is getting lower and my base is getting smaller, um, I have to become comfortable with, the ten- with being under tension. Like, I mean, you're going to feel like you're going to explode anyway, but as I try to push myself and this base is getting smaller, it's easy to feel like, okay, I can't handle this, but I can train in a bent press more often than I could train a squat and still get that feeling of tension because I can just fluctuate the weight of the kettlebell and I'll still be able to practice holding tension, breathing and bracing at the same time, all that kind of stuff. So what interested in me is that you said that I was the only person to say that. Yeah. So I was like, oh, okay. And I get that most of your clients aren't training, aren't training to compete in anything, but do most of your clients only do like kettlebell stuff or do you not have people who do barbell stuff or like, what was it that made that answer so unique? I think that, well, for one, bent pressing is not that widely used to begin with. Okay. So that already excludes 
not exclusive. It's the king of the lifts, Aaron. I, you know, I'm trying to spread the noise and pressing. Yeah. Me and Try a few it. other people. Yeah. <laughs> um, but I, like, we do have a couple of our students who maybe have recently started training bent presses along with um, some squats. I am, I have one person who I'm training, they are bent pressing, um, but it's kind of a newer movement and not super comfortable for them okay. yet. So, okay. And they're training zercher squats. So they probably haven't seen how they I got you. together just yet. But okay. um, I agree with you. I think that um, I found in my own practice that training bent press, well, I feel like it helps almost every lift. So oh, yeah, yeah. But, <laughs> yeah. um, I think a lot of people, if they did train both, you know, for a length of time and went a little bit heavy with it, I think that they, a lot of people would find that um, crossover like that. The other reason I like it is having, I'm losing my girth around the waist now. And so I'm finding that I'm able to twist a little bit better. Um, but then I feel like instead of getting weaker because I've, I started, well, I started with the side press cause I didn't know how to bend press at all. And the closest I could get was some weird side pressy looking thing. So I improved my side press first. Um, but anyway, so I feel like possibly my tendons and my ligaments are getting stronger. And that's what's enabling me to still continue to hold weight and, and withstand tension, even if I'm slightly twisted, because uh, the bent press is helping me with that kind of tensile strength, I, I guess. Um, yeah. How is it, you guys bent press in slightly different ways. Um, you have, did you, you like kind of squat a little bit more, I think. Uh, how yeah, long? I can also do it. Uh, I can do it. I've seen I, you do the hinge way too. Like all different ways. Okay. Yeah, well, yeah, kind of are like, you strong for us elite? you like, yeah, you don't hear about me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But go ahead, yeah. go ahead. <clears throat> and then he has kind of a more signature, like he always does. Uh, starts a little hingy and then drops his hips. So it becomes sort of a hybrid. Right. Yeah. Um, I think like I'm still trying to figure out which way works the best for me because I, the, the thing is I have, the reason I even hate running is because I injured my knee in boot camp on the Marines. Mm -hmm. And so it, um, I actually when not, the injury first occurred was maybe three weeks before the final physical fitness test to get out of boot camp, oh. but I was ready to leave. So I ran that final PFT. It's actually kind of embarrassing because I ran the final PFT unable to bend my right leg more than a couple of degrees. But I ran faster than I ever had before. It's three miles before or since. I've never run three miles that fast <laughs> since, and I had never run it that fast before that. I was like, it's time to go, all right? <laughs> so, yeah, I did three miles in 21.48, and I was just like, I'm rolling because I'm ready to go. Okay. <laughs> so I was going to say it's embarrassing. Um, but in any case, so for me, the squatty form is a little bit weird, even though I prefer sumo deadlifting. And uh, it's, I guess the hinge part is too much like a conventional deadlift, which I, I can do, but I'm not as comfortable with. So it's just kind of weird. So to turn that back onto your clients, you said you got somebody who's just now discovered it. How is it that you're able to kind of use your two experiences to help translate that into your clients? Because I love some of the drills you guys show. So how do you interact with people that sometimes you don't even see because you guys coach a lot of people online? How do you go through that process of walking somebody through something that feels so foreign and then relate it to something else they know? You're like, oh, well, it's like, let's say you drop something and you also want to pick something off the ceiling at the same time. Oh, whatever. <laughs> yeah. It's a good way to think That's of it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, we like to break it down into drills. So piece by piece, giving them drills to try that help them feel different parts of the bent, of what the bent press might eventually feel like. Okay. So we give them those first. We don't just say like, okay, try a bent press without other kind of movement prep. So we'll stick with the drills for a little while. And then until those, when those start looking good or they start to feel a kind of groove with them we'll have them try we sometimes might have a hint a, like a hint about what which style we think will work best for them but sometimes so we'll, we might assign that style to them or we might just say okay now's your time to try just try to do the full thing getting under it however feels best to you and then we give them feedback we kind of keep giving them feedback and tweak it a little bit as we go okay yeah. Um, 
one of the things that I've noticed that someone who's, uh, you can tell an elite coach, is how much they learn from anything, right? So I remember, I mentioned Joe Lewis, and I remember I was in a class, a seminar with him. Of all things, uh, I think he was teaching us how to properly headbutt. I'm not, that's not what we signed up the seminar, but this, this relates, right? <laughs> it's like, where is this question going? No, okay, so he's teaching us how to properly headbutt. But the seminar was a footwork seminar. The reason we got on how to properly headbutt is someone did something in the class. It wasn't a headbutt, but he noticed how their feet moved. And he asked uh, my coach uh, how long that person had been training. He said, oh, he just started. So that sparked something in Joe's mind. He said, oh, and he said, okay. And he started teaching. He said, well, this is, would actually be a good way if you're going to headbutt somebody. He starts talking about hitting with the horns and all that. And so afterwards, I asked, you know, like, the, you know, I asked the follow-up question. I said, how did that happen? And he said, well, when you get to a certain point, you actually learn more from beginners because they don't know you can't do that. Their body hasn't been taught programmed ways. How much do you guys learn from your students? So much. A ton. <laughs> we get so much inspiration for, for our drills from them. Yeah. yeah. Like I, uh, I love learning new things <laughs> for ourselves. But then I feel like there's a whole other level to mastery of a movement once you start teaching the movement. Okay. Yeah. As I, um, uh, I remember it's like, uh, I mean, I've seen it too, because I have kids come through here and they just, they want somewhere to work out. A lot of it is because they just want to hang out with each other or whatever. And so I have, I've had like 50 kids uh, come through my home gym, just they're friends with my kids, just whatever reason, or I happen to know their parents, just whatever. They come through and they're trained here. And there's so many times I, in trying to explain something to them, I actually end up explaining it to myself better. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, yeah. So, like, for example, we're talking about squatting. And uh, I was trying to get them to, uh, you know, spread the floor, spread the floor, right? And they're not getting it. What does that mean? I said, okay. So, I said, okay, so imagine, I said, you guys watch Kung Fu movies? Like, yeah. So, okay, imagine you're walking on that rice paper, right? <laughs> and then you stand on it and you try to tear the rice paper with just your feet. Oh, yeah. Okay. I said, well, do that now. <laughs> and <laughs> yeah. I was like, but it kind of clicked in my head because I'm like fighting through, I went through like six different me other metaphors to just yeah. try to explain this. I can't even imagine with you guys like teaching online what you have to go through and like, you know, how, so for like a 20 minute interaction, you spend two hours researching other things to just say, well, we got to get this guy to, you know, whatever. Is that what your dinner table conversations look like? <laughs> <laughs> we, we definitely have conversation out, outside of when we would like to. About <laughs> walks, though. Sometimes we're like, this is going to be a work walk. Yeah. And we're, okay. we come up with good ideas that way. Yeah. Is that where the question about cookies versus cake came from? That's on your questionnaire. <laughs> It has to be there. It's important. Oh, okay. We we'll often have the dialogue of like, you know, which one do we like more? Which one are we feeling like more? What should we have? Yeah. Yeah. So that's okay. we just need input from other people. Oh, okay. Help me with dinner. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so I bring up the cookies and cake thing because that is part of the application process to be a client of yours. You have to apply. You can't just say, I want to, hey, uh, I'm showing up and I'm hiring you. I think for especially in America, people aren't accustomed to the idea that someone may not want to train them. So what are the things that you look for in an ideal client? Well, um, first off, we, we try to make it known like how we actually help people in the services that we do offer. And um, sometimes when we get applications, if, if, it's, um, if it's just not a good fit, like let's say we get a, a beginner kettlebell lifter who okay. doesn't know how to do a kettlebell swing or even just a proper hinge, we are not going to be able to help them. Right. Right. It's just, it wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't be a good idea for us to try to help coach someone from the ground up online. Okay. Other people can do that. They're set up for that. That's just not something that we do. So if it's not a good match, we are okay with trying to help that person uh, maybe find a better match. Yeah, and that that can look like sending them, finding out where they are and trying to connect them with a trainer that we know where they can work in person with them. 
because that's usually the best way for beginner beginner uh, to learn kettlebells. But also um, other other people who do live video sessions with people, I think that would be a better way too. But we the way that our online coaching works, it's like we give them we give you this is what you do and then you take videos, send them back to us and then we'll look at them later. It's not a live interaction. Gotcha. So it can, I think it can be done better that way, but that's yeah. not the way that it works for us. All right. Let's talk about this, uh, ebook. You guys are about to be published authors. Um, what, you know, tell me what got you guys. I've written a couple of books. They're not training books they're fiction books, but I understand how exhausting that process is because you're really pouring yourself into something. Um, and it's good that there's two of you because otherwise whoever's writing the book is going to annoy the crap out of the other one because you're constantly going to be like, Hey, can you read this? Hey, can you read this? Can you read this? And I've, I've annoyed my family a lot. So, um, the thing is it's a challenging endeavor. So number one, what made you guys decide to do it? And just tell me more about who it's intended for and what do you, what problem you want to solve with it? Yeah, it is definitely nice, the two of us working on it. Um, we were actually working on it maybe like three minutes before this video call right here. So, yes, it's definitely time consuming. Um, yeah. But uh, so we started it. A lot of people, like you said, know us for bent pressing. It's like one of our favorite things that and snatching is like our thing. Yeah. And um, we also have a lot of people who are very confused by the movement and right. who need help and um, not everyone can afford or even wants to do one-on-one -on -one online coaching with us. So this is a way for us to have a standalone product for people um, that they can practice on their own time. Okay. Um, so I've read, I only know of two other books on bed pressing that already exist. Um, the Arthur Saxon book, and he obviously knew how to do it. Um, I, I still am in awe. Like when I do my little, I remember getting excited because I did uh, 135 in the bar with a barbell. And I was like, yeah, you know, I'm screaming and making all this noise. And then I read something that was like Arthur Saxon. I knew it, but you know, you just see it again. <laughs> it's like, yeah. did over 300 pounds. I was just like, my manhood is just, just gone. <laughs> Thanks. All right. But uh, so Arthur Saxon. And then there's Dave Whitley's book on bin yep. pressing. The thing that bought that caused me to have issues. I'm not, those are both good books. Uh, but what I really was looking for was not just a static photo. Like I want to see the movement, you know what I mean? And so I started looking on Instagram, which is actually how I ended up finding you guys. Cause I, I literally put in bent press hashtag yeah. bent press on Instagram. I said, I got to, I want to see, as many different ways as there are to do it. I saw Nagar Fanoni. She had like an awesome video where she did the two different, the squatty style and the hinge style. Mm -hmm. uh, she and someone else did it. Uh, that was on YouTube. And so I just started looking. So, you know, this is 2020. So are you guys going to have videos in your book? Yeah. Because it's an ebook, right? It's an ebook. So it's not going to be, there is definitely text, but the emphasis is not on the text. It's more on here are the drills. Okay. And there's a program in it too. So do try all the drills for a while. And then once you get set with that, then do the program. Uh, but yeah, so it's, it is very drill and video heavy. I think we have right now 20 or 21 videos and they're not all like 20 variations of bent presses, but you no, know, no, no. movements that progress you to a bent press. We have about 20 different videos in there. Yeah, because I, I like that one. There's there are two to stick out in my mind that you guys did. One of them is the uh, actually there's three. I, I better stop counting, cause but we'll just go with three. There's a uh, one where you use a band to help people understand the tension, and I actually like the fact that you showed not just from the front but from the back. You're like, okay, this is what it looks like from the back. There's the one that you did where it was sort of like a bent press arm bar or something like that. It mm -hmm. uh, you did, and then the one that. I really, really, I use this to this day is where you talked about sliding your forearm down your leg when you're bending over. Um, because I think that's what freaks people out. I know it freaks me out a little bit. It's like, okay, well, what's holding me up right now? That doesn't, this doesn't feel natural. This is an unnatural thing, whatever, right? And then, so you're like, oh, well, you can put your forearm here and slide down. It's like, oh, okay. Yeah, yeah, that, that worked a whole lot. So 
<laughs> so I hope those three drills I just mentioned, I'm plugging them, put them in the book. I want to see them. I'm going to get your book and I want to see these drills. And somewhere around the caption, John mentioned, John recommended we put these in there. It would be nice too. <laughs> <laughs> no, you, know, you don't have to pay me. I don't have to be paid, but just go ahead and just my full name. I'll show you. You spell it and all that. The third, not my dad, me. <laughs> <laughs> so uh let's uh start uh, wrapping this up with a couple of questions that i really wanted to ask you guys what was your proudest moment as coaches it's basically when when you see someone's eyes light up or that they they express to you that basically they never thought they could do the thing that you just helped them guided them to do nice and just opening up those new possibilities for them okay uh, and those happen, they don't happen all the time, but, you know, they've happened enough to where you're like, yeah, that's the best ever. <laughs> <laughs> On the one hand, I firmly believe, and I believe you guys do as well, that you got to keep an element of play in your practice. At the same time, strength is a skill. And so you need to devote time to it, which is why I think you should keep it fun, because yeah. you're more likely to do it a lot if you enjoy it, right? A lot of people, man, they want to make training like, I see these posts like training is a job. Yeah, I approach it. I'm like, but then you find that this person's only been training for like three or four years. I've been lifting weights since 1993. Uh, I've been doing martial arts since 1996, 97. If you don't keep it fun, how do you sustain that, right? How do you get that concept across to the people you, that you coach? Like, yeah, okay, it's serious, but it's, and you're paying for it. But we're keeping it fun. I recognize you're paying me and I respect your time, but we're keeping it fun because it's actually to help you continue your practice. How do you help them understand that? Um, so most of our um, marketing or just the way that we are presented to people in general is through Instagram. And the vast majority of our content through posts or stories or whatever is of lighthearted nature. So I think people who take training really serious or like maybe the kind of person who thinks that training is their job and maybe it is for some people and that's fine. Yeah, sure. Um, I don't think that we really attract them to begin with. Okay. okay. People who um, follow us, follow us because they like that we have fun. And it's some people have said it's like a breath, breath of fresh air because it's, not too many people do that in, in fitness. It's obvious. It's a uh, oftentimes yeah. very serious. So when we get our students working with us, I think maybe they have come to expect it that it's going to be a little bit fun. Nice. So. Mm -hmm. It can be really off putting or it just like, if it's not fun, why get into it? Like as yeah. a beginner too. And, and why continue to, yeah. it's not fun. so, so that has, has to be central. For us. Yeah. At the same time, you do have to do it. Do you guys ever have to crack the whip? <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't say that with our students. That's really our style. Okay. Um, maybe sometimes for our own selves, we're like, okay. uh, I don't really feel like doing it, but you know, I got to get my snatches done today. So unless there's something like really, we're just like, no, I'm not training. But usually with our students, we don't really crack the whip we may we'll definitely check in on them yeah. right yeah but we understand you know <laughs> life there's, happens there's and... things in life that yeah are important well, because they're not training uh, i know you guys have said that a lot of the people that you train don't they're not training to compete in anything so a lot of people if they don't have that external motivator um in this year uh a lot of people haven't had the okay the weddings the the mm -hmm. get in shape for the graduation the we're going to go to the beach, any of that stuff is a lot of stuff is gone. So without, when the external motivations go away, then it's like, it's so easy to have a snack accident and to just not train. Right. So how do you, yeah, I guess keeping it fun is part of it, but how do you say, okay, look, you do have to, the training is fun, but you do have to go do it. I mean, I guess they, I think that's hard because we are, people usually come to us pretty motivated okay. to start. So there's not a ton of, sometimes people, you know, things happen in their life and, and they just like honestly do need a break anyway. So, okay. and that's fine. 
Like we're, we we kind of don't crack the whip. We're like, do what feels good for you. Okay. <laughs> well, I guess that's part of that whole questionnaire. Like, are we a good fit? Like, are you the kind of person that's self-motivated or am I going to have to be your dad and call you up and say, Hey, you know, look, let's have a talk, you know, that kind of thing. Cause right. yeah, I guess like, like, if we just took on everybody that was even remotely interested in working with us, that probably would be a thing. Or if we, we did all the fitness type services, like let's say we did fat loss, which is definitely not our thing, you know, yeah, I got that with the cookies and cake thing. Yeah, that's, yeah. <laughs> okay. I think if we did all these different types of things and had all kinds of people, that the story might be different. But Okay. All right, last question. Um, how can people get in touch with you? Or how can they follow your training? Maybe they just want to get a preview of some of these videos that are going to be in the book, including the three that I recommended. Um, how, they, how do they uh, check you guys out and follow you? Or how do they find out if they, you know, how they can apply to train with you? Yeah, they can follow us on Instagram at Lift with Holly and Aaron. Uh, the, there's a link in our bio that takes them to our website where you can also apply and, and see all of our other programs and stuff too. Okay, right. awesome. Yeah. Well, I appreciate you guys uh, coming and hanging out with me, talking and laughing a little bit. I really appreciate the chance to talk with someone who's uh, come. I don't really talk to a lot of people from Dan and Asano's lineage. It's just that's California and I'm over here on the East coast. So it's harder to, to interact. So it was really, really cool talking to you guys. Appreciate you spending time with us. Hope you guys enjoyed this video as much as I enjoyed talking to Holly and Aaron. Don't forget to check out their Instagram and don't forget to hit like subscribe and share this video with your friends.